Thank you, Tim, as always. Tim does create cheat sheets with the words to those songs and puts them in the pulpit here. I come by every now and then and throw them away. <laughs> so he has, to, he has to keep those words in his memory. Um, if you have your Bibles, look with me in Matthew chapter 5. While you're looking there, let me say about Jeff that, you know, there's so much right now that we don't know about his medical situation or what's going to happen, and we'll learn more over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll, we'll need help probably to, to make sure that things get done around here while Jeff addresses his health issues, just like we did with Wes when uh, he addressed his health issues. Uh, and like with Wes, to cover all the things that Jeff does week in and week out takes a, a village of people. And so uh, the Lord may be calling some of you to help, <laughs> and you just don't know yet. But the more we know about uh, what he's going to be able to do and what he's not going to be able to do over the coming weeks and months, uh, we'll be able to make decisions and know how to ask for help. Right now, all of this is still real early for me, well, for all of us. And so uh, we're, at this point, we're just trusting the Lord. So thank you for your support for him and your prayers for that family. And uh, isn't it good to be a part of the body of Christ? Amen. So... Weeks ago, I began a series, well, months ago, I began a series of sermons out of the Gospel of Matthew. We've reached uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, is a difficult text to preach through, but we're going to do it anyway. And last week, we began by uh, looking at the Beatitudes. And I told you that we often interpret this text incorrectly, that the Beatitudes, I think, are telling us that that God's Spirit has brought God's kingdom into our lives as an act of grace. And my character has changed as I participate in that grace, as I live the Word of God, as I do the Word of God. The change in my character opens a door to a double portion of God's grace. And uh, everything I experience is grace. God's grace upon grace upon grace. It has everything to do with God's grace through Jesus Christ and very little to do with my capacity to be a perfect person. Having said that, God does expect me or Jesus does expect me to live his word as the Sermon on the Mount makes clear and we'll see this week after week. Today we're going to look in Matthew 5 verses 13 through 16 where Jesus uses two vivid metaphors to focus his followers on how they will impact this world with the double portion of God's grace working in their lives. You can't, in other words, the world cannot not be changed when God pours out a double portion of grace into our lives. One portion would be enough to change the world. God pours out grace upon grace. What Jesus says is the reality of God's presence, his grace at work in our lives and in the world matters. It changes things. And so he uses two strong words to help us to understand the impact that that has on the world as God's grace plays out in our own lives. First, he says it's like salt, and then he says it's like light. So let's look, Matthew chapter 5, I'll start reading in verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Have you heard that before? Yeah, this should be familiar to you, especially those of you who have been going to church for a while. 
I'm going to tell you what I think is most important about the text, and then some of you will be going to sleep. I wish you Godspeed. But if you're staying with me, we'll unpack what this means. But if you hear nothing else, this is what I hope you hear, that our lives, our circumstances, and our relationships are the front lines of God's advancing kingdom on planet Earth. Let me say that again. Our lives, our circumstances, and our relationships are the front lines of God's advancing kingdom. Our lives are where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And so Christians are to permeate society. We are to be out there in society as agents of God's grace and redemption. We are to be out there taking God's grace with us out there into the world. How we do that, Jesus says, is compared to being like salt and light. So we're going to look at those two different metaphors that Jesus uses here. First of all, he describes us as salt. And I think that what he's saying is that a follower of Jesus Christ will have a distinctive and powerful presence in his or her relationships and circumstances. A follower of Jesus Christ will have a distinctive and powerful presence in his or her relationships and circumstances. And Jesus describes the essential nature of his followers as salt. And he says that they are like this because of the presence of God's kingdom, of God's grace in their lives. And he is emphatic. You are salt. He's not saying you're becoming salt. You are salt. And in the ancient world, you've probably heard things like this, that in the ancient world, salt was a purifying or a cleansing agent. It was essential if you were going to preserve food, especially proteins like meat or fish. And it was used also to enhance the taste of some foods. Uh, We, the parable of the loaves or the story of the loaves and the fishes where Jesus multiplies, uh, you, you remember that from Sunday school on the flannel board, Jesus multiplies loaves and fishes and feeds thousands of people. The fish in that story are salty, are salted, and they are eaten with the loaves to make the loaves taste better. I mean, that's just how, well, you can think about everything, the implications of that. Uh, it was a preservative and also was meant to make some of the food just taste better. Jesus was saying the presence of his disciples is essential to the world in which we live. Your presence as a follower of Christ is essential. And salt is different from any other food. The power of salt lies in the fact that it is different from any other food. And so it is with Jesus' disciples. We are to be different. That difference makes a difference to the world. We also see that a Christ follower's power and influence in the world lies in his or her difference from the unbelieving world. Ancient salt was impure and could lose its saltiness. Jesus says of the impure salt, it has the power for nothing. Its force is given by its saltiness. Lacking that saltiness, it had no power. And so its fate was to be thrown out and trampled. It's useless. And think about what Jesus is saying. The followers of Christ have no value to God's kingdom or to the unbelieving world if they blend in with the rest of the world. If we're just like everybody else, there's no point to any of it. Jesus has no relevance or significance. If he doesn't even matter to the people who claim to worship and follow him, then what does he matter to an unbelieving world? So Jesus was saying that his disciples needed to live differently from the immoral world, from the corruption of the world in which they lived. The difference is the presence and participation in God's grace. God's grace changes our lives and it changes how we live from day to day and the presence the 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 the, the, as we participate in God's grace 
the world around us feels the effects of that. Now, I'm trying to understand salt because uh, I'm reaching that age where sodium becomes a big deal, right? So, I understand that salt enhances the flavor of foods, not necessarily because we like the saltiness, but because it suppresses other things in food, such as bitterness, uh, that sour taste, metallic notes. It also has the capacity to bring out sweetness in foods, or that flavor called umami, that savory quality in some food. And salt brings all of that out. And so I'm told that some foods taste better when salt is on them. Food like watermelon or grapefruit. I'm told that chocolate tastes better if it's got a little sea salt with it. I'm also told that popcorn is pointless without salt. Or roasted nuts are just not the same without a light salting. You can also use other ingredients that add salty flavor to food without adding salt itself, such as feta cheese or olives or capers or salted butter or soy sauce. It adds that sodium quality that foods apparently so desperately need. Whether you agree with all of this salty food or not, one thing I think is certain is that you notice either the presence or the absence of salt. Salt is one of those things that matters to cooking. And I think what Jesus is saying is that God's grace matters in my life. It, it makes a difference. My participation in God's grace matters. When I live the Word of God, not perfectly, but faithfully, over time, living by grace, that matters to my life and to the world in which I live. How I take that grace into the unbelieving world matters. The presence of God in our lives should matter. And the question I want to ask is, does my presence in my relationships and circumstances bring the grace and the presence of God? I told you before, what this world does not need is more of me, more of my opinions, more of my thoughts on things. What this world needs is Jesus Christ. I'm to take Christ with me as I live in this world, and that matters. Jesus then goes on to talk about light. So the second thing I want to tell you today is that a follower of Jesus Christ will reflect the light of Jesus Christ directly into the darkness of the unbelieving world in big and small ways. A follower of Jesus Christ will will reflect the light of Jesus Christ directly into the darkness of the unbelieving world in both big and small ways. So Jesus says to his disciples, you are the light of the world, which implies that the world is in darkness. And what scripture tells us is that Jesus Christ is the light. And elsewhere in the book of John, he says, I am the light of the world. And so here in Matthew, he's saying that his followers are pointers to and reflectors of that light of Jesus Christ. It's not our light that shines, it's the light of Christ shining off of our lives. Are you following me? Yeah, that's what matters in the world. So Jesus' disciples are a visible representation of the arrival of God's rule or God's kingdom in people's lives. The followers of Jesus show the world what a life looks like where God's kingdom, where God's grace is present and active. So there's some implications of what Jesus says here. First of all, Christians may potentially influence the world on a grand scale, like a city that has been built on a hill. And Jesus' language here is interesting. A city built on a hill is built as a piece of assertiveness. 
It expresses a certain confidence. It's a claim of importance. It expresses a desire of the inhabitants of that city to play a wider role in human affairs. People who want to live quiet lives don't build cities on hills. They tuck them away in quiet little corners behind trees and all of those things. And Jesus says that his followers are like the city that's been built on the hill for everyone to see, to have influence and to be assertive, to have a role in the affairs of that region. God may give you the opportunity to reflect the light of Jesus Christ in grand ways, potentially influencing many people and a wide variety of circumstances. You may have the opportunity to be like a city on a hill and to reflect the light of Christ in extraordinary ways on a grand scale. If so, then be a good steward of that platform if you have it. And shine the light of Christ into darkness. Jesus also says that Christians uh, may potentially influence the world in small ways. Like a lamp placed on a stand in the main room of a house. The lamp used in typical Palestinian homes was partially uh, closed over a reservoir made of clay. You put oil into that reservoir. You put a... A, 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 a wick of flax or cotton into that oil through a spout and you lit the wick and it would burn. It was a fairly small lamp. It gave off modest illumination. Thus, in order to maximize its potential, you put it on a stand in the middle of the room where its light could shine. Many Jewish homes at that time were often modest one-room structures. And so an elevated lamp could potentially give light to everybody who was living in the house, but not much beyond that. But those lamps were essential in the house, especially for finding one's way in the enclosed areas with all the people and all the animals and all the stuff. Have you ever tripped over things in the middle of the night? Yes, it's so frustrating. We need light to help us to see And so the only time you placed a lamp like that under a measuring bowl was to put it out. Otherwise, you let it shine. And I want to tell you that God may give you the opportunity to reflect the light of Christ into our dark world in small but essential ways. And if that's the case, be a good steward of that reality and reflect the light of Christ into your family your workplace, your school, your relationships, your circumstances. Either way, we who are the light of the world must be prepared to be located in places of clear visibility, on a lamp, on a lampstand in the middle of the room, or like a, a city built high on a hill for everyone to see. We, our lives, are to be seen and not to be lived in secret. Jesus says in verse 16 that a Christian's life uh, lived by God's grace is to be seen by the world. A Christ-like life is to display the reality of God's grace. So verse 16 is kind of like the climax of these verses. The emphasis is on deeds that give glory to God. Jesus here teaches that we are not to live cheap grace and easy believism. I'm called to participate in God's grace. I'm called to live differently. I just don't go on as if I never knew Christ. Jesus is to change my life. And so the imperative in verse 16 is shine your light. It's an active verb. It's not passive the way that it's sometimes translated into English as let your light shine. It is emphatic. Shine your light. Shine your light by actively participating in God's grace. Do the word of the Lord. Live out the word of the Lord. Obey Christ. Stop trying to find excuses to not do the word of the Lord. And do the word of the Lord. The challenge is to live out in public what Jesus says we are in our hearts. 
And Jesus says the outcome will be that people are impressed by what God is doing. By what God is doing, not by what we're doing. When it's genuinely living out the word of the Lord, what people see is the Lord. And not our lives. So God gets the glory and not the Christian. And according to Jesus, there is no authentic discipleship apart from doing the deeds he taught his followers to do. Let me say that again. Jesus is clear here and throughout the Sermon on the Mount. There is no authentic discipleship apart from doing the word of God. Disciples of Jesus study God's Word. They obey God's Word. They teach and train others to study and do the Word of God. They do this as a joyful response to and participation in God's grace given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We live the Word of God. Now, this week, on July 5th, the, uh, A press release described how researchers at the University of Geneva have shown that the response of the retina to light depends not only on the intensity or brightness of the light, but also on the temporal shape of the light and the order in which the colors are organized in the light spectrum. Now let me, I had to have somebody explain this to me. So let me tell you what the significance of this. If I don't see well, what I am prone to do is turn on a brighter light, right? And especially on my iPad or on my computer, I have that thing turned up the brightest that it will go so that it drains my battery. (laughs) Otherwise, I can't see as well. What these scientists have shown is that it's not necessarily the brightness of the light. But the shape of that light and the way that the colors are are delivered to me, that matters most. The temporal shape of light refers to the pattern or structure of the light over time, such as a, a steady continuous illumination, rapid flickering, or pulsating rhythms. And the retina's response is affected by the specific temporal shape of the light stimulus, even when the intensity or brightness of the light remains constant. The shape of the light matters. Furthermore, they said that the way in which the colors are organized and presented to the eye help me to see better. So what does any of that mean? Well, scientists can gain a better understanding of how our visual system processes light and color information, hopefully leading to advancements in vision science, perception, and maybe even the development of better display technologies. All of our screens, all of our TVs, everything that we look at, we can see better if they understand how our eyes see better. Here's the point. If our eyes depend on the shape of the light, and when Jesus says that you and I reflect his light into the world, The way we reflect the light of Christ into the world matters. The way you reflect Christ's light, the way people perceive the light coming off of your life, that matters. It makes a difference. We can live so that people perceive and experience God's presence. That's the good news. But beloved, we can also live so that our lives muddy the waters and people don't perceive the presence and grace of God. How we live, how we shape that light reflected off of our lives affects how others perceive and respond to the presence of Jesus Christ. People will perceive the light of Christ and give praise to our Heavenly Father when they see our good deeds, our participation with God's grace in our lives and in the world. Which means that I need to ask myself, how is my life reflecting the light of Christ into my relationships 
in my circumstances? How am I reflecting Christ into my life? All right, to wrap this up, if I haven't lost you already, let me make a different effort. Let's talk philosophy and quantum physics for a moment. Uh, So I want to tell you about the concept of emergence because I think this is relevant to the point Jesus is making. When we talk about emergence in, uh, in, in quantum physics and in philosophy, what we're saying is that complex things can arise from simpler parts working together. In other words, the whole is always more than the sum of its parts. And when individual things interact with one another, something extraordinary happens that doesn't happen if those things aren't present and interacting with one another. So a group of individual elements or components come together and create something new and more complex that has properties or behaviors that the individual parts alone don't have. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. And so you can think about this in a lot of different ways. So here's a couple of examples. First of all, think about water molecules, which is H2O, right? How many water molecules does it take before your hand is wet? And the answer to that is very complex. It depends on the number of water molecules on your hand at any given time. It depends on how much oil and uh, bacteria and, I don't know, grime that's on your hands. It depends on how hairy your hands are. And all of those little crinkles and wrinkles in your skin and how deep those things are. And how dry your skin is. And all of these things come together. And at some point, your hand is wet. But before that point, it's not. Wetness is an emergent property. That depends on a lot of different things working together. Are you following me? Here's another example. Ants. One ant is probably no big deal. But when they start working together, I get scared. Uh, One ant, one carpenter ant or leaf cutter ant probably isn't going to make much difference to your yard. All of them working together can strip your tree overnight. See, the, the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So those are just small ways. But we see the same property working out in families. Your family is more collectively than just the individuals who make up your family. The same is true in churches, in nations. You can consider things on a large scale, like the Allied effort in World War II. All of those nations working together produce something different than any one nation by itself could have accomplished. That's emergent. That's what we call uh, an emergent property. So here's what I want to tell you about what Jesus is saying. I think the future is an emergent property which means that it is not fixed or predetermined. The future emerges from the interactions and outcomes of various factors, people, and events happening in the present. Uh, Your life, your future is not solely determined already, and there's not any one factor or individual that determines your future. Rather, your future emerges from the collective influence of multiple elements, such as actions and decisions and events. You might think of it this way. Imagine you have a group of people planning a party. Is it predetermined how that party is going to unfold? I'm going to say probably not. Each person has their own ideas and preferences. They make choices based on their own interests. They interact, they negotiate, they make decisions together, and the future outcome of the party begins to take shape. The final party plan is an emergent property because it arises from the collective input and interactions of all the individuals involved. There's give and take, just like Thanksgiving at your house. Nobody gets everything they want, but we work together to create something that we all experience. Similarly, on the larger scope of the world, the future is shaped by the interactions of countless individuals, organizations, social systems, technological advancements, environmental factors, and more. These elements shape uh, each other, leading to the emergence 
of new possibilities, challenges, and outcomes. The future is not predetermined or fixed. It unfolds and emerges based on the complex interplay of many factors, including your life. And here's the point. Our presence, what we say and do or don't, influences how the future unfolds. And this is why Jesus told us to be salt and light. Please be present in a way that matters so that Christ is revealed, so that God's grace can operate to redeem lives and situations. Your presence matters. With the people you're around, in your family, in your Sunday school classes, uh, in your, where you work, where you go to school, the people you talk to and interact with on social media, you name it. Your presence matters. And Jesus says, be salt and light. Live it out. Your presence affects everybody else. It affects the way the future unfolds. It matters to your family. It matters where you work. It matters to your school, to your community, to the nation, and to the whole world. Jesus says, in big ways and in small ways, your life and influence matters and makes a difference. So please make sure you are living according to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. What this world needs less of is you and your opinions. What this world needs more of is Jesus Christ and his grace that we operate on day in and day out. So I want to ask you or invite you to consider making a couple of different commitments today. First, I invite you to make a commitment to live and speak so that your relationships and circumstances are salted by the grace of God. Make a commitment to live out the word of God so that your life becomes salted with God's grace. The people you interact with day in and day out, they need to experience the grace of God. The second thing, I invite you to make a commitment to follow Christ so that his light is reflected well into all your relationships and circumstances. Reflect Christ into the world. This world has enough opinions and thoughts, and dreams. What this world needs is Jesus. Let our lives reflect his light into the darkness and brokenness of the people we encounter day in and day out. I would love to tell the people I know how they need to live their lives. (laughs) They're not listening to me. What they need is the grace of God. They need Jesus Christ. Less of me, more of Christ. So in a moment I'll pray and then Alan Ray will come and lead us in a time of response. I would invite you to respond to the word of the, word of the Lord and the grace of God today. Maybe you need to make these kinds of commitments. There may be other things that God has said to you today. While we're singing, this is your opportunity to respond to what God is saying to you. And if you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. I'll be standing down here while we sing. You can come and pray with me. When this service is over, uh, I'll be out in the foyer for a time. You can find me out there. I'd love to visit with you. Uh, But what is God saying to you today? Let's pray together. Lord, if it's true that the future is not set in stone and that our lives make a difference because of the way we influence people from any, at any given time. I pray, Lord, that today what Jesus says about being salt and light would make a deep impression on us so that we would consider how we are participating in your grace, how we are living out your word, so that our presence 
uh, salts our relationships with the grace of God. Help us to live so that it is Jesus that's reflected into this world. Because that's what this world needs. The people I know, the people I work with, the people I encounter in this community, what they need is Jesus. So help me to live so that Christ, the light of Christ, is reflected into the darkness and brokenness around us. And I pray that you would move in the lives of all of those who are worshiping you today so that Christ will be made very real to them and through them. Make us salt, make us light. And may your will be done. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing today?